Thank you, Elder Wabagoon. <clears throat> now I, I would like to invite the Honorable Jill Dunlop, Minister of Colleges and Universities, to kick off the 2024 Micro-Credential Forum. Minister Dunlop has been the member of Provincial Parliament for Simcoe North since 2018. Born and raised in the town of Coldwater in Simcoe North, Jill witnessed the importance of community and small local businesses early on as her grandparents owned and operated Dunlop Plumbing and her parents were actively engaged community members. Prior to being elected, Jill attended Western University and later joined the faculty of Georgian College. She is also the mother of three post-secondary aged daughters, all giving her unique insights into the world of higher education. In 2019, Jill was appointed Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues in the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Service Services. In 2021, she was appointed Minister of Colleges and Universities and was reappointed to the post in June 2022. Please join me in welcoming Minister Dunlop. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Rich, for the, uh, the introduction, and thank you, Elder Wabagoon, for, thank you, for starting us in such a, a great way, um, for opening our minds, for everyone ready to learn, everyone that's in this room today for the conference, joining us online, um, and for those of us who have to go to question period, too, so that would be helpful. <laughs> and I want to thank eCampus for hosting this forum and for your role in advancing micro-credentials in close collaboration with our post-secondary education sector. This is an excellent opportunity for leaders like all of you to exchange ideas and solutions to address sector challenges while looking ahead to the future. I also appreciate that this year's theme is focused on developing tomorrow's workforce, a goal that is always top of mind for me and our government. As Ontarians continue to navigate a rapidly evolving labour market, we know they're eager to explore faster pathways to learning, to help advance their careers. And that's why in Ontario's 2020 budget, our government announced over $60 million in the micro-credential strategy on which we've made significant progress to date. This has included investing in the development and launch of a new micro-credentials portal to make it easier for learners to explore hundreds of rapid training opportunities in one place. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge eCampus Ontario's important role in this work, expanding the portal to include new micro-credential offerings and enhance the user experience and features. Through the strategy, Ontario also became the first jurisdiction in Canada to offer student financial assistance for micro-credentials, with hundreds already approved for OSAP. As we continue to expand program offerings, we want to keep micro-credentials affordable and accessible, ensuring anyone can access this training regardless of their financial situation. We've also supported the creation of hundreds of micro-credential programs through the Micro-Credential Challenge Fund, helping learners to quickly retrain and find new employment. In fact, the first round of the Challenge Fund was a great success, largely due to the collaboration between Ontario industry and post-secondary institutions. Creating micro-credentials that help learners to gain the exact skills that employers need. In total, with your help, we've created over 300 new micro-credentials to support approximately 6,000 learners. Look at the impact that you're making. And so to build on this success, last year our government announced an additional $5 million to launch a second round of the Micro-Credential Challenge Fund. This investment will help institutions create even more flexible, industry-relevant micro-credentials to train more learners in our province, all with the goal of building a skilled, inclusive, and reliable workforce for today and tomorrow. We know that micro-credentials provide individuals with a competitive edge in healthcare, automotive, advanced manufacturing, and other in-demand sectors. I'm pleased to say that the government re received excellent proposals for the second round of the Challenge Fund, with many focused on these important sectors. Thanks to those in attendance today who submitted a proposal, and I look forward to connecting with the su successful applicants soon. 
Whether it's a mid-career professional who wants to upskill for a new opportunity, or a new college graduate who dreams of working in an emerging field like electric vehicles or AI, we're building a post-secondary landscape that values and supports learning that's tied more directly to the needs of the labor market. And I think that we can all agree, this kind of change doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And I am proud of the thoughtful, strategic work happening, not just within the government, but also with partners like all of you. It's our job to continue to work together and create paths that help people in Ontario succeed. The future of micro-credentials in Ontario looks very promising. It's great for students, for employers, and post-secondary institutions alike. And we are excited to build a workforce for tomorrow where Ontarians can upskill and retrain when needed to get that next great job. Thank you again to eCampus Ontario for hosting today's forum and for your continued support and leadership in strengthening post-secondary education in Ontario. I wish everyone a great day of discussions. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate that you're taking the time to do that. I know you're very busy and you have to run off to, uh, to uh, attend the question period in the house. I'd love to just stay here. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could maybe beam you in by Zoom and ask some questions uh, remotely. Uh, I do want to thank you for your leadership on the micro-credentials file and that of your governments. We share your belief in the power and the value of them. And I also want to say on behalf of the sector to thank you for the work that you did and the funding announcement that came on Monday. This is a foundational investment that is going to be a, a real game changer for our sector to continue to offer Ontarians the kind of world leading education that they have come to expect. As you and the Premier have pointed out, our Indigenous institutes and our colleges and, and our universities are key drivers of the innovation economy and we thank you very much for this investment. Thank you very much, Robert. <laughs> thank you. So, bonjour, bonjour et bienvenue, and good morning and welcome everyone to the 2024 Micro-Credential Forum. I want to thank Elder Wabagoon for opening uh, the event today. Namigwech wa wia wabagoon gi naskak nang manda nongo ekijep. Namigwech wendam ga kidyen, I'm grateful for your words. Gaminadjuim gimen ido kiyen, you honor us in doing a ceremony. Nimikwa Megomi, women one go ziyang mam pid mawen jidiwen. We are reminded to be joyful here at this gathering. Meanwhile, women aden magna shakak mikwe, and to respect Mother Earth. Several months ago, in this very room, Elder Wabagoon suggested that I might do well to learn a few words in uh, Anishinaabe Moan. And I'm really grateful for that guidance. Uh, since January, I've been enrolled in a class uh, taught by Amy Debesaga at uh, Kenjigewinteg, which is one of our Indigenous Institute's uh, uh, members. I I'm super grateful for Amy and all of the uh, classmates for the patience in helping me learn not just a few new words, but new ways of seeing the world. And thank you, Elder Wabagoon, for the, for the challenge. So new ways of seeing the world is actually an excellent way uh, to, to frame today's discussion because it's in seeing the world through other ways of knowing that we come to learn and to respect each other. I do want to acknowledge a few other people who are in the room with us today with Anne-Marie Vaughan, Dr. Anne-Marie Vaughan, President and CEO of uh, Humber College, uh, also our board co-chair. We will be shortly joined by Dr. Stephen Murphy, uh, President and Vice Chancellor of Ontario Tech University, also a board co-chair. Uh, Jenny Heyman and Andre Cote board members are here as well. Uh, Marilyn Harry will be here uh, a little bit later as well. Uh, we have some of our valued sector partners. Um, Lori Deschamps, where's Lori? I saw her earlier today. There she is. Uh, president of Voshke Pamasho in the Wenjak Institute. Uh, I think Marsha Josephs is here as well. Is Marsha here? No? Executive Director of the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. She was on my list uh, to be here. 
I do know that Carlos Paz Silvan is here because I saw him earlier from Technion Corp, uh, one of our technology partners. And uh, Zoe Croker, who I've only met on Zoom, uh, said that she was going to be here. She's our Assistant Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. So Zoe, if you're here, let me know and uh, we'll, uh, we'll meet in person for the first time. Uh, I do want to thank all of our many speakers who are here today to share their stories as well and to learn with each of you. Nous sommes ici aujourd'hui pour apprendre comment nous pouvons travailler ensemble pour construire un système d'enseignement post-secondary plus réactif. We are here today to learn how we can work together to build a more responsive post-secondary education system, one that helps everyone see themselves into the future. Today we know that education is more important than ever. And today we also know that education as we know it is changing rapidly. Now there's two important things that I'd like to say about micro-credentials to frame up our day. And the first is that micro-credentials are essential for access. We heard the minister talk about um, the micro-credential strategy launched in November 2020. For the first time in Canada, learners in Ontario can get a student, lo lo student loan for part-time learning. And that's a huge difference that will make it. Recognize us for the first time that not everybody can afford to take time out of the workforce to learn new skills. It's my belief that more than any change to post-secondary education, this alone will have the largest long-term effect on access. For all of you PSC researchers in the world, prove me wrong. The second point is that micro-credentials represent a signal of change. So we've always had micro-credentials. We call them courses. We call them continuing education certificates. The main difference now is that these types of courses are constructed as more consequential components of lifelong learning. And perhaps more importantly, we now are focused on teaching competencies rather than just content. Content is important, but competencies even more so. Last week in one of our online sessions as part of the forum, we heard about micro-credentials in Australia and how expansive definitions of micro-credentials uh, enable more people and more institutions to see themselves into the future of education. And this is instructive. Hi, Marcia. <laughs> the point here is that micro-credentials represent a key indicator of change. These are a shift in the mindset about how we offer education to all of us that now stream movies and music rather than buy DVDs and records. And speaking of change, Today, we're really pleased to be releasing a new prototype for how people can interact with the Ontario Micro-Credentials Portal. This proof of principle tool, built with our partner, Technion, is available now at skillsfinder.ai. It uses a custom GPT powered by OpenAI to help learners better understand their skills gaps. You can even upload your resume, and the GPT will tell you what skills you have, what skills you need, and the best micro-credential to fill that skill gap. We want to help people understand the competencies that are inferred by the credentials that have been conferred. And we want you to help us learn about this as well. That's why we're releasing the MVP today. By enabling people to test the new skillsfinder.ai, we're going to be able to learn how people interact with and use AI in supporting their personal learning journey. I've seen a whole bunch of really cool tools. Um, there's one in Academica this morning. Seneca has launched something as well. A lot of people are doing really good things with uh, the AI tools that we have. So please check out the eCampus Ontario booth in the partner hall and try it out. This is just one way that eCampus Ontario is helping our members to increase learner opportunities as we work together to develop tomorrow's workforce. So today you're going to be hearing from many excellent ex uh, examples about how micro-credentials are helping to reshape education. And this is important. The work that you are doing is important. Each of you are agents of change. So miigwech, merci, and thank you for joining us today. I'm now going to turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Stephen Murphy, our co-chair, uh, followed by Dr. Anne-Marie Vaughan to say a few words of welcome. Is that correct? Over to you, Stephen.
welcome Anne-Marie Vaughn to the stage. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to eCampus Ontario's Micro-Credential Forum for 2024. I want to start by thanking uh, Elder Wabagun uh, for that wonderful opening and for grounding us today in our discussions. Thank you so much. And uh, to Stephen Murphy, who you'll hear uh, shortly, my uh, um, exceptional co-chair, I have to tell you, I really enjoy uh, serving on the board of eCampus, and I uh, can't think of a better university partner than uh, Stephen Murphy, who's the uh, president of uh, Ontario Tech. Uh, to our minister, who's clearly, and as you know, a, a quite a vocal advocate for the work that we do every day. And of course, to Robert Luke, I mean, everyone in this room, do I need to say anything about the exceptional leadership that we have at eCampus? And uh, Robert, a lot of the movements that we've been making over the last number of years are a testament to your leadership as well as to everyone at eCampus. And so I want to thank you on behalf of the group. So I want to thank eCampus Ontario for bringing us together today as we look to build on the exciting field of micro-credentials across the province and beyond. This year's theme, Developing Tomorrow's Workforce, is an important reminder on the collective responsibility that we all have as institutions, employers, and partners in meeting the local needs of Ontario's workforce in a rapidly changing global economy. With this in mind, your contributions and expertise are integral to shaping the future of higher education and positioning Ontario as the best place to recruit and retain workers. By working together, and creating successful partnerships between industry, community organizations, and post-secondary institutions, we can improve learner experiences and prepare the future workforce to thrive. Over the past few years, we have made significant progress in the development of micro-credentials as an important option for, lear for learners and as part of the wider landscape of higher education. And you all know that micro-credentials benefit both workers and employers in many ways while driving innovation. That micro-credentials workers, through micro-credentials, workers can acquire new skills or improve existing skills in a flexible, fast, and affordable way. And since institutions can offer individuals greater flexibility in how they access learning, learners can take a micro-credential even while they're working then this benefits employers as their workers bring added value and knowledge to the workplace. Companies can work with an institution to deliver micro-credentials in the workplace using their own facilities as a classroom. None of this is new to the people here today. Micro-credentials also allow us to dive deeper in our collaboration with industry partners as we work together to determine what specific skills are needed now and into the future. A future that I continue to be optimistic about and one that's filled with endless possibilities. Our unique positioning is the convening power of eCampus to bring together indigenous institutes, colleges and universities to share knowledge and expertise. While there are challenges ahead, I am encouraged by our common goal to lead into the future as a strong, relevant institutions that provide the best possible experience for our learners. That's why, for me, this is the time to be bold and to be courageous, to embrace opportunities and to build a better future that will empower every learner in ways we could not have ever imagined in curriculum, teaching, and learning. I have said at other eCampus forums that you are the change makers on our campuses. That brings excitement and a heavy obligation at the same time. In this, I know your efforts will continue to be extraordinary, and I am honored and excited to be on this journey with each, with each and every one of you. Guided by the remarkable team at eCampus, we look forward to the important discussions you will have over the coming days, and I wish everyone participating 
and inspiring and productive experience. Thank you, Miigwech. Hoping you can hear me. It's uh, it's great to see you all, and let me say um, this is one of the best organizations to work with. Congratulations to our CEO, Dr. Robert Luke. Uh, Anne Marie Vaughn is a real pleasure to work with. You are champions in the sector. Thank you, and welcome to our uh, micro micro credentials forum. Um, I wanted to say a few words today. What we don't often realize when we're in the midst of a paradigm shift that we're in it. It's always historically looking back. And so the work you're doing is so crucial. Let's just do a little thought experiment for a moment. Imagine a world in which you receive a degree or a diploma, very valuable, and then you have a career, and then you retire from that career. That's no longer the world we live in. And yet so much of our structures are still built upon this notion of we go to university or college, we get our job, we don't look back. And in a world that very much values highly trained, highly skilled workers, it is completely insufficient to be thinking our entire lives are not going to be filled with learning. Hence the importance of micro-credentials. Micro-credentials offer an avenue into competency-based learning. As Robert mentioned, to me, that is the future. Employers want to know that their employees, their prospective employees, have the skills that they need today and into the future. We have to be able to demonstrate that. And as a post-secondary sector, we haven't always done the best job with non-traditional or lifelong learners. That needs to change, and it changes with change agents like yourself. We need you to be thinking about what does a competency-based outcome look like that tests and ensures you've met a competency as opposed to teaching toward an exam, which may or may not reflect well on how much you've learned. In the midst of this shift, we need to make sure that each step we're taking moves us toward the end goal of ensuring that people welcome the opportunity to enrich themselves throughout their lifelong process. This is something that we will see take hold over the next decades. It takes a while to shift society, but when it shifts, it will move quickly. So you are doing some of the great foundational work that will make our sector either highly relevant or have to really scramble to catch up to what the private sector is doing. And I'm betting on the former. Let's be relevant. Let's be first movers. Let's take advantage of the people in the room. Have a wonderful forum. And please uh, set your uh, sights on the highest possible achievement and vision in terms of where micro-credentials can go, because really they're synonymous with lifelong learning and much more flexible learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, Anne-Marie, and Robert. This forum represents uh, the largest of our many community events throughout the year. Um, I'm very pleased to share with you that uh, 2024 has actually marked a historic uh, registration number. More than 250 people are registered to be with his, us here today in this room. That's a full house for this venue. Another 300 are tuning in for live stream of everything that's happening in this room and another 660 registrations for the pre-conference sessions held last Thursday. That's surpassing 1,200 <laughs> registrations. 
This is a testament to the importance of these forums for learning and also to the shared interest in the changing face of education. The volume of online registrations for those joining us from across Canada and indeed the world is also a testament to the importance of innovative approaches to getting people into programs and then into jobs. Before we get into the program, I have just a couple final uh, items I wanted to cover. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors. The Micro-Credential Forum is proudly sponsored today by CCI Learning, Magnet, and Readocracy. Please do take time to visit these innovative groups in the main hall throughout the day. And um, I also have it on my uh, responsibilities to share with share with everybody here that in case of an emergency resulting in evacuation, we have two main meeting locations established as part of our emergency response plan. Uh, they are David Crombie Park and Parliament Square Park. And I think this is the moment where there's going to be some slides that show a map uh, that, uh, that will reinforce that message, uh, as well as um, a display showing the map of the building and uh, where the uh, emergency exits can be located. Um, we also have a fun photo booth set up outside in the hall, so please uh, take time to visit the photo booth. Uh, don't forget to go have a conversation with the skillsfinder.ai app. Uh, it is set up in the main hall, and we have about 20 iPads available if anybody would like to test it out as well. And um, please do join us for the networking reception um, at the end of the program today. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Rhonda Barnett, CEO of Palette Skills, to walk us through the first presentation of the day, Building a Future Ready Workforce, How to Unlock Canada's Highly Skilled Workforce and build a more inclusive economy. Rhonda has over three decades of experience as a female trailblazer achieving great heights in male-dominated industries and institutions. A STEM graduate in mathematics, she is a successful executive, entrepreneur, and director, as well as a key voice in Canada and around the world on industrial policy, skills of the future, and diversity. Rhonda was the first woman in history to chair the National Board of Canada's oldest, largest trade association, the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Rhonda, has, Rhonda is also the founder of Canada's Women in Manufacturing Initiative, led by CME, and funded in part by the federal government's Ministry of Women and Gender Equality. Welcome to the forum, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you see me? Can everybody see me? Can you see me? Everybody can see me. Because if you can see me, you can be me. That is my motto in life. And I have my own personal story around my potential being unlocked to realize tremendous success. I'm now in my dream job that I didn't know I could have. I'm the CEO of a national not-for-profit doing really cool things. But when I entered my post-secondary education, I had no idea what I would do with it. I took a math degree. I was really good at math. I had no idea where that could take me. But through life, all of my experiences and opportunities and coaching and mentorship and skills training took me on a path to realize my full potential. I've been standing on stages like this around the world for over the last decade to talk about untapped potential, the untapped potential that we have in our workforce and the need to better utilize that untapped potential for Canada to compete and grow. And today I want to share with you how Pallet Skills is working to unlock that potential across Canada. So as some of you may know, I grew up in a blue collar family. I lived in a world where people made things and I loved it. I loved it so much that it became my professional life helping to start and run a manufacturing business 
in the city of Peterborough, Ontario, big manufacturing town when I grew up. And here's what I discovered along the way. For employers and workers alike, there's nothing like the sense of accomplishment that comes from achieving your full potential, seizing new opportunities, and making the most of the skills and talent at your disposal. So that's what I want to talk to you about today is potential. I'm going to focus my conversation on potential and unlocking that potential in Canada. This is our mission at Palette Skills with our program called Upskill Canada to train workers and connect them with fast growing companies so they can achieve their potential. When you look around Canada, a skills gap just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, frankly. We're a very well-educated country. In fact, we rank second amongst all OECD countries in the percentage of people who pursue a post-secondary education. We're a leading economy in the world, and we're a popular destination for skilled immigrants. And yet, we keep hearing the same refrain. We can't find enough skilled workers. In fact, almost half of Canadian employers say that talent is their number one challenge to growth. This slide talks about that. But what I know from a sectoral lens is specific sectors cite even higher numbers. I know that in manufacturing in Canada and around the world, 75% of companies are saying that skilled talent is their number one impediment to growth. So that's where I got my start in this space. What I've learned is that too many Canadians don't have the skills they need to be seen as qualified for the good paying jobs that they want. And this all comes at a cost to our country. Economists tell us that the skills gap is costing Canada about $25 billion a year in lost economic value. That's a big number, but to me, the real impact can be felt in our individual stories. The company that can't find the skilled workers that it needs to maximize production, to expand and grow, so it struggles while its competitors gain ground. I know how that feels because I've been in that position. I've been the business owner who's had to actually turn away work because I couldn't find enough skilled talent to seize the opportunity to increase my capacity and seize the opportunity. Or let's look at it from the other side, from the perspective of the worker with years of experience, but denied the opportunity for good new jobs because they lack a certain skill that has become essential in the past few years. They're often labeled or feel labeled as not qualified. So where does that leave us? We have companies and workers alike falling short of their potential. And what that creates is a double drag on the economy and on productivity. Companies can't tap into the skills they need to grow their businesses, and workers can't reach their potential and make the most of their working lives. That should be an imperative, isn't it? Make the most of their working lives. Upskill Canada is about transforming this dynamic. Our programs are squarely focused on moving people into new and better jobs and doing so as quickly as possible. So let me take a moment to give you some examples. I'll start with Colleges and Institutes Canada, or CICAN as they're very well known. And we have several uh, officials here from CICAN today. Uh, it's Canada's largest post-secondary network. Great institution. I'm very pleased to announce today that Palette Skills is investing in CICAN to upskill a thousand people in four of the fastest growing sectors biomanufacturing, advanced manufacturing, agricultural technology, and clean technology. We're announcing that here today and across the country. They're going to be working with us to develop micro credentials supported by micro placements. 16 weeks or less in duration. I'm happy to say, and this is interesting, that the resources developed through this initiative will be made available to institutions as open educational resources and accessible well beyond the duration of the project. 
This is a really exciting project for Canada. The next slide uh, is a slide representing the investments that we've made across the country to date. Some of you may be in the room. And I'd like to share a few highlights of our program investments. A lot of this is just getting started. We are just funded in, in March of last year. Uh, at the University of Waterloo, we have a digital transformation course. It's 13 weeks, and it's aimed at those working in the field of advanced manufacturing. It includes specialized technical training along with career coaching and industry engagement because our courses aren't just about learning, they're also about getting hired. At U of T, we have a 16-week data sciences and machine learning software foundations course, an opportunity for rapid skills development in a very fast-growing industry, and a chance for Canada to strengthen its pipeline of talent in data sciences. This next one is really of interest to me. At Norquist College in Alberta, we have a 16-week course geared to neurodiverse individuals or those who identify as autistic. The focus is on upskilling in data analytics and business intelligence, all supported by individual employment assistance and training in data presentation. I'm very excited about that one. At uh, NATE, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, we have a 16-week course to equip people to work in the clean energy industry. It starts with a primer, of the science behind the clean tech industry and moves into work play placements with industry partners. Participants gain technical knowledge and hands-on experience, giving them the tools that they need to advance in their careers. Each of these programs on its own is changing lives, altering careers and the futures for the better. One worker, one Canadian at a time, but together, under Upskill Canada, they represent something bigger. They represent a concerted effort to upskill our national workforce for the good of the individuals and for our shared benefit, for the good of Canada, in terms of productivity, growth, and our ability to compete as a country in the world. That's the beauty of upskilling. When it's done right, it's a win across the board. Workers win because they acquire in-demand skills that they need to secure good jobs and build successful careers. These individuals will now advance in the, the economy. And companies win because they are able to find workers who possess a very specific set of skills. These companies are often then equipped to grow and advance in the Canadian economy. So in other words, we take that double drag on the economy and we turn it into a double lift. That's how Canada wins, because our economy advances when our businesses do better and when our people find good and better work. So these programs illustrate how we at Pallet Skills are taking a different approach in this space with Upskill Canada. So I want to take a few minutes now to describe very simply what's unique or different about our approach and what's so special about Upscale Canada. First and foremost, we are employer-led. We consult and we listen. Why? Because it's, it's the best way in my view, and it's really the only way uh, to be certain that workers are getting the appropriate training at the right time. You know, through Upscale Canada, we don't want to spend a lot of time and overtrain workers. We want to just give them what they need to get to that next job, to get the, to that next opportunity. Because upskilling loses its purpose if it's out of date, or if it fails to consider the urgent and very specific needs of the companies that are searching for workers. Because those needs can change in a flash. At the end of the day, I think of Pallet Skills through Upskill Canada as a matchmaker. Upskilled worker, meet fast-growing company. I think the two of you are going to hit it off, but we wouldn't be much of a matchmaker if we didn't consider the needs and goals of both sides of the relationship. It comes down to one clear imperative, by listening closely to those who are ready and eager to hire, we can better ensure a perfect match between upskilled workers and fast-growing companies. The second difference with our Upscale Canada worker is that we move fast. 
We want to get programs up and running quickly. We are not taking years to develop the curriculum with our training partners. This has to happen very quickly and it has to be deployed quickly. We don't want participants to spend more time in the classroom than is necessary. It's building off of what Dr. Stephen Murphy was saying, that we really want to just give them what they need at the right time to keep them going. And people can do this while they're still employed or looking for that next opportunity very quickly. So it's about getting the skills and it's about getting the job. But the, the other lens to Upskill Canada is because we're funded by what used to be called Industry Canada, by ISED. So it's about moving at the pace of industry. So now we need to think about upskilling that's moving at the pace of industry. So third, uh, we focus primarily on mid-career workers. We've heard a lot of that um, mentioned already today. Those who've already spent time in the workforce. Canadians over 45 make up almost half of the long-term unemployed in our country. But when you talk to employers, I used to be one of those. Here's what they tell you. We like the older workers that we have. They're good at their jobs. And in one survey, 87% of managers said that employees 45 or older were every bit as good and sometimes better than their younger cohorts. So we need to access that untapped potential in Canada. Companies out there are looking for workers with maturity, the ability to work in teams, and with experience in making tough decisions. But they also need to have the right skill set. So by investing in these mid-career workers, we in Canada can unlock a vast resource of untapped talent while allowing more Canadians to make gains personally, professional, professionally, and even financially by enhancing their existing abilities with new skills. The fourth and final difference with Upskill Canada is how we measure success. I want to be emphatic about this. It's not about the number of people that we train. It's about the number of people who get hired. That's our mandate with Industry Canada, with Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. As someone who's spent decades in manufacturing, I have no interest in training a training program that delivers a 100% graduation rate and yields a 30% useful hiring rate. I just have no interest in that. So we have a mission mandate inside Palette Skills with Upskill Canada program. And we wear that proudly on our shirts and we've coined that hashtag jobs because we come to work every day to ensure that more Canadians are getting access to those in-demand jobs. That's what we're here for. Now, some of you will know that the company that I run, Pallet Skills, has operated for uh, a few years on a relatively small scale. We're proud of what we've accomplished, but we've always aspired to do more. And when the federal government decided to invest in an upskilling program, they turned to us. They entrusted us to oversee and operationalize a $250 million investment to improve the skills of Canadian workers to solve a business problem for industry. So now we have a real opportunity at a national level to demonstrate the best way to upskill Canadian workers and to begin to close the skills gap. Our pan-Canadian team, some of them here today, you can connect with them, they are working with training partners like you and employers across the country. We're not here to make new training schools, to make new post-secondary post education institutions. We're here to leverage the capacity that we have in Canada and repoint it and focus it. Our focus is on making sure that upskilled workers find meaningful employment and that companies are better able to find the people that they need. That's that simple. That's what we're here to do. That's the key measure of success, and it's the only way we're going to begin to actually close the skills gap in a meaningful way across the country. So where are we focusing our efforts? Well, right where companies tell us to. Industry is our customer. Academia and training partners are our service providers, and participants are the, the product that, uh, that we are positioning for industry. So we have training partners, like those in the room, that are, from, uh, that are focused in advanced manufacturing, biomanufacturing, agricultural technology, clean technology, cybersecurity, and digital technology. 
These are the sectors that the government has asked us to focus on. We are solving for very specific job area needs. And if you go to our website, you'll see a report from Deloitte that really talks about the job areas across Canada that require the focus, and we are investing there. With each match, an employer gets a worker with a precise and relevant set of skills, and a worker gets a job with a company in a fast-growing sector where their skills are in demand. And in Canada, over time, comes to sorry, and Canada over time comes to benefit from a more targeted and integrated upskilling ecosystem that serves to build a stronger and more competitive economy. Let me tell you what I like most about the Upskill Canada program. This isn't just policy work anymore. It started there. It's turning policy now into immediate action for this country. It's I like that we're not just talking about the problem anymore, we're not just analyzing it, we're attacking it, we're solving it. We started. We have to start somewhere. And we have to be convened in a way that's going to matter. We didn't waste any time in introducing our first cohorts of trainees. Thousands of Canadians are already enrolled in our programs. We're going to keep announcing new partners and new programs in the months ahead. We're going to keep matching our graduates with employers who need skilled workers and we're going to keep helping them all to achieve their full potential. And all of this serves to really address the skills gap across the country. But we can't do it alone. As I said, there's others in this space doing great work, and many of you are in the room. We need to leverage your capacity in Canada to upskill more Canadians in this way. Our goal is to create a model to focus and enhance the training ecosystem that, it, that exists in Canada to solve the most pressing skills gaps together. To do that, we all need to keep our finger on the pulse of the working world. Every now and then, I do find myself with someone who has a very old-fashioned notion of the manufacturing world, someone who's maybe never even set foot in a factory, let alone a modern factory. And I think uh, Dr. Stephen Murphy talked about this as well, that, you know, that person thinks about the same worker doing the same thing for 40 years until they're going to retire. That's what my grandfather did. You know, he worked at General Electric in Peterborough for 40 years, and then he retired. But those days, of course, are long gone. Our world moves fast, and technology is changing very fast, and no one should expect that the skills that they learn in their teens and 20s will sustain them through their career. We live in a world where lifelong learning is essential. Our work, sorry, we, we should just maybe take a look at the automotive industry to clearly demonstrate this. It's a sector I have a lot of experience with, but you know, today's cars aren't like the cars even 10 and 20 and certainly 30 years ago. Today's cars have millions of lines of computer code and dozens of electric control, control units running everything from the brakes to the headlights. There's electronics and software making up about a third of the car's value now. It's basically a cell phone on wheels. That one image should be enough to emphasize the importance of adapting, learning, and upskilling over the course of a working lifetime. We have to keep up. That's how we create new career pathways for Canadians, and that's how we can better position Canadian companies to compete both domestically and internationally. Before I conclude, I want to talk about the importance of inclusion, which is a big part of our mandate at Upskill Canada, supporting those who are underrepresented in the tech workforce, including women. In 2015, I began leading a movement in Canada which led to a movement around the world to add more women to the manufacturing workforce. I was able to do that, to be the voice of that. And next week is International Women's Day. So I would like to today to highlight that to compete in the world and win, that we just can't afford to leave behind an entire segment of our population. And we are here today to talk about ways to unlock our highly skilled workforce because we need the best talent. We need the best men and the best women. We need the best people. Inclusion brings together different abilities, perspectives, and backgrounds to produce a better outcome. The hard truth, of course, is that women still make up a disproportionately small percentage of the workforce in the technology sectors. Manufacturing, it's around 28% in Canada. Skilled trades, 
in Canada is 5%. Like there's a lot of work to do in the, the technology jobs and the technology sectors for women. But now, more than ever, there's an opportunity to help women and other, other underrepresented groups find their way to the door and find a pathway to a position that brings a sense of accomplishment to fulfill their potential. As I started my discussion this morning, I said, if you can see me, you can be me. And through Upskill Canada, we can help ensure that more underrepresented people can be seen as qualified talent sources for employers. We're all here today because we really care about the future of work and the jobs of tomorrow. We care about helping people fulfill their potential and make the most of their working lives. We have so much potential as a country, yet like any country, we face challenges. Some of them are complex and intimidating, frankly. But some of them, like the skills gap, can be overcome. If we act with purpose, if we find and build on what works together, we can solve this problem. We know the specific skills that are in high demand. We can teach those skills to people with experience in the workforce. Those who have a desire to step up to a new level in their careers. They want it, those people, they want it. And most of all, we can connect these upskilled workers to companies in need. That's what we're trying to achieve with Upskill Canada. We're bringing employers and employees together. We're putting them both in a position to fulfill their untapped potential. And we're doing it all across the country for the good of companies, for the good of workers, and for the good of Canada as a whole. Let's work together. Let's work together to unlock the potential of our highly skilled workforce and solve this problem for Canada. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So I've just maybe teased you with the program. I'm happy to take some questions and I do have people in the room that you can talk to later for more specific questions if I can't fully answer them. But I understand there's a mic uh, has a question over here. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Rhonda. It's really, I'm amazed and excited about all the things you're talking about and doing. Um, one of the things, and it's kind of a common question that I have, is uh, it's nice for employers that the federal government has given you money <laughs> to, to upskill workers. Uh, it's nice for the workers when that is no cost to them, and I'm seeing a lot of that on your website. That's really exciting as well. But what are the employers actually contributing to this process? They are the beneficiaries of upskilled workers, other than their advice about what they need. What else are they doing in partnership with you to, to fund and promote this program? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Uh, so they're doing a lot of things with us, and obviously we have to demonstrate value to those employers so that they will do even more. I'm not going to get another investment from ISED unless I've got industry doing more. But right now we do have them working with us to clearly identify where the gaps are, where the most pressing gaps are, and then we're bringing them into the, the curriculum design with the training partners, and they have to donate their time to do that. And we're also asking that they come into the classroom in meaningful ways with, um, you know, with uh, a case study or, you know, every, every delivery partner has their own way of working with employers. But employers must be donating time into the classroom and engaging with the students while they're learning and having that kind of experiential component to the learning so that it, frankly, de-risks the, uh, the offer to the the employer when they've done that, uh, but they need some skin in the game, and right now it's their time, but o over time, uh, it's going to be our goal to ensure that, that there's gonna be money on the table from industry as well. It's gonna be expected by the federal government. But right now, we need to demonstrate the value of doing this, and that industry really sees the value in this methodology and is gonna put their money down. Hi, I was really interested in uh, the CI CAN partnership and the OER offering to institutions, and I was just wondering if you could tell us sort of how uh, institutions will access that OER and when. Uh, I think I'll leave that to CI CAN, and maybe uh, we do have some folks here. There's going to be a press release that goes out nationally today, and maybe we can have a follow-on on that as it's 
it's their program and the, their timelines. Um, so we'll commit to get that information out to, to the group either today or by email at a later date for everybody, if that's okay. Okay, thanks. I don't know where my timer is, but do I still have time? Yes, okay. Thank you very much. That's an excellent uh, discussion. I, I want to just follow up on the, the industry piece because, you know, Canada, we have a million companies, 98% are small to medium sized enterprises, average size, five employees. You know, most of them are probably worried about payroll next month or mm -hmm. sales channel, you know, in the next quarter, that kind of thing. How do you work with them to get them to see the value of investment and what can we do as a group to support that? Yeah, so that's a work in progress for sure. But, uh, you know, as we've been piloting over the last few years, we've worked with small groups of companies and, and continue to work with bigger groups of companies. But it's really about demonstration. We have to have champions, right? We've got early adopters to the system that are now champions. And there, there's some big organizations, one like D2L. Everybody, I think, in the space knows D2L. They were an early adopter where they were able to secure talent from our early programs, and now they're a champion. So right now, our, our methodology is really about the early champions from the programs and to, um, to really sp spread that uh, across Canada. Fairly soon, I've got my chief, new chief operating officer here in the back, Carl Heinlein. Uh, we're going to be launching a uh, access portal for our programs, a one window access to the programs, and it's going to be a way to really draw industry into the program to see what we're doing, to see the, the talent that's being offered, to see these skills, and to engage with that in a meaningful way. So we really think that that's a way to scale our impact across the country. We have a question from our friends online. Uh, how does Palette address the issue of portability across jurisdictions and employers of the micro-credentials you've developed? Yeah, that's a good question for today, isn't it? Uh, we don't really address that. Uh, so our program actually has no requirements around micro-credentials, but we think it's a really important tool set uh, so lots of the organizations that we funded offer micro-credentials, but you can see uh, on the list that we showed before, there's some private training partners there as well. So uh, we are actively, actively looking at some kind of Upskill Canada certification to really carry that specific credential or certificate across Canada to show employers, I've been through Upskill Canada, through this academic or institution or private training partner, uh, and I've got this skill. Uh, so that's something we're actively working on. Uh, but really our focus is not so much about the credential, but the specific skill that the job placement requires so that they can connect, they see the skill is there. Uh, but we do see value in finding some way to, to make that more portable across the country. But it was not required by the federal government that it needs to be that portable at this point. Uh, uh, Rhonda here, Monica, this side. Uh, thank you, firstly, for the lovely presentation. I think for me what really stood out was the fourth point, which is the measure of success, where you talked about that this is about the workforce getting hired. So my question was around that, that do we have any data to show once this work workforce is hired, uh, what is, how are they performing in the industry? What is their retention rate? You know, like I would be really keen on knowing about that. Yeah, so uh, you can go to our website to look at the specific statistics, and I think I have my research and evaluation manager in the room, but I will try to speak to that. So we, we piloted uh, the approach for about five years through different uh, funds with ESDC and different uh, economic development agencies in Canada. And what we were seeing uh, with a very sort of hands-on focus was we were getting, you know, up to 90% placement rate out of some programs. Uh, but it was very, like, hand-holding and, um, you know, we had wrapped our arms around these people. And we were seeing that um, about... 
30% of people, I think, and Emily will correct me if I'm wrong, 30% of people were promoted to another opportunity in the same company within 18 months. So we're, we are following the, the group of participants that we've piloted through this style of program over the last five years. We're continuing, continuing to monitor that and share those results. And again, our access portal is going to be also streamlining, the, streamlining those results so that we can get good intelligence on what's making a difference, what programs are using what approach, and, and you know what's more successful about that approach than, than the other. And that's why we're here to convene all of that and to share the best practices. Right. Uh, we are at time now. We have time for one last question over here. Make it work. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm not an English-speaking person, but I'll try. My question has so many branches. Like, first of all, I wanted to know what is um, what should be the targeted um, public for the micro credential. By that, I mean like if I'm a worker already and I think that I need to get to level up my skills, uh, should that help me um, go like, you know, uh, um, my salary, you know? Should my employer recognize that? And yeah. on the other side, if I may, uh, I just graduated from high school, what is the value of just having a micro-credential? Because it doesn't, for most of them, uh, it doesn't give you credit. Like, what is the value of that for me not going to university and just taking a micro-credential? And uh, how do my employer value, they value my skills, I do, I do understand that, but how do they value it in terms of salary range? Is it yeah. gonna be a, uh, just a, a like, <laughs> is it going to be just uh, like first level, you know, yeah. first level uh, job, or how is it going to work for? No, that that's that's a great couple of questions. So I can tell you, um, we have a mandate from the federal government to track that, and we are trying to work with training partners and employers to ensure that overall the participants that engage in the program and are employed are achieving at least a 5% salary increase over, over the whole program. So it's something that we're working to mandate and figure out how we position ourselves to, to deliver on that. But the, the clear way to deliver on that is with the value. The, the skilled worker does more is, more, is very important, it's valued, and the, the employer is going to pay more for that. I can tell you in our own programs, we've been working on a sales boot camp for six years in Canada. And we've been taking people that are hospitality facing, retail facing, precarious work, minimum wage work, putting them through a six day boot camp, and then positioning them into jobs at a very high placement rate where they are making between 50 and $70,000 a year to start. So that's a really big jump from a small program, from a small upskilling program. So those are the kinds of things that we want to invest in, things that make a meaningful jump. We're here to talk about transitioning labor, not, you know, this isn't professional development that we're talking about. This isn't just training and professional development. We're on a path. We're transforming the labor force. We want step functions here. We want people to step up with short cycles, training and upskilling to get better paying jobs. That's what we're here to do. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, okay, we're going, going to take a uh, quick break. Uh, please take a moment to uh, grab a refreshment, visit one of our sponsors out in the hall, and we will be back here for our next presentation at 11 a.m. <laughs>